Welcome to the Body Electronics Point Holding Intensive. Ladies and gentlemen, for the next seven days, you'll be embarking on what for many of you will be the adventure of your lifetime. Some of you have travelled vast distances to get here. I'd particularly like to honour uh, Mary Laws and Cliff Oliver and Chris and Margaret Wheelerhan who've travelled across the planet all the way from England to be with us here today. Can you stand up, please? <laughs> I'd also like to honour Horst, who has joined us from Thailand. Stand up, Horst. <laughs> And from Singapore, we've been blessed with the company of Valerie and Paul A's John. Stand up, Valerie and Paul A's. Thank you for being here. And I'd like to honour each and every one of you for making the decision to step out of your comfort zone and do something significant for yourselves. So give yourselves a, a warm round of applause. Uh, my name's Rob Rubens, but as some of you already know, I prefer to be called Kanan. Um, together with my wife, Sukara Douglas, uh, I run a video business called Global Vision, distributing information that matters. Um, I'll give you a bit of an overview of how we got involved in body electronics. Uh, a few years ago, we recorded some seminars and started making these tapes available um, through um, health magazines to the general public and uh, the response was phenomenal and point holding groups sprang up all over the country. Uh, some of the people in these groups then felt the need for more guidance so we asked Dr Ray if he would come to the Gold Coast for a week to facilitate a point holding intensive and we feel extremely honoured uh, that both Dr Ray and Dr Anita Zavatsky Ray agreed to take time out from their busy schedule to come and help us run this event. Thank you, John, and thank you, Anita. <laughs> now, most of you at some stage have spoken to Jennifer on the phone. Uh, she's our coordinator, and along with Sakara, she's been largely responsible for all the organisational aspects of putting this intensive together. I think she deserves a round warm of applause. Stand up, Jennifer, <laughs> at the back there. Um, so any problems you've got or any special requests during the week, she's the one to speak to. Um, at the back of the room, we've got our cameraman, uh, Ian Brett. Um, he'll be record. Yeah, give, give Ian a clap. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Uh, he'll be recording all the lectures and these will be made available to the delegates at special discount prices uh, at the end of the intensive. All the lectures and point holding sessions in this intensive are entirely optional. However, to obtain maximum benefit, uh, we suggest that you make an effort to attend every lecture and every point holding session. And at the same time, um, I'd like to stress that you need to take responsibility for your own needs. So do what you feel that you need to do. Um, now, although this week has been designed as an experiential healing journey, we've included some lectures each day as an opportunity for you to fill in the gaps of your understanding in body electronics. So, if you have any questions, raise your hand and Jennifer will pass you a microphone. Now, this is necessary because, uh, for the sake of the video, to make sure that we get all the questions recorded. So please try and refrain from just calling out and which people always do um, whenever you know you suddenly think of a question um, and most importantly we want you all to have fun uh, and that's really important when it comes to healing you get the best healing when you're having a good time so um, it is now my great pleasure without any further ado to hand you over to Dr John Whitman Ray and Anita Yvonne Zavatsky Ray thank you
I want to personally, on behalf of my wife and myself, I want to just really extend to you our heartfelt greetings to each and every one of you. In looking through the an, an enormous number of little letters that I received, uh, which bring tears to my eyes sometimes because of what experiences each person has gone through. There has been tremendous traumas, tremendous pain, uh, tremendous struggles that are represented here today. I mean, I'm serious. It's just tremendous, tremendous um, uh, life-threatening situations that are here. And I'm grateful that you're here. We only have seven days. But seven days will give you guidelines that will last the rest of your life. I'm reminded from some of the numbers of problems that some of you are seriously suffering from. I remember back about 1952 um, when the Korean War was going on. It's a number of years ago. I was in university at the time. And uh, many of our Many of the fellows my age were being called up for the draft. And I can remember the feeling I had that I, did, I felt I didn't need to go to the war. I didn't want to kill anybody. I had no desire to hurt anybody. And so I thought to myself of the different, different possibilities that I had of not going to war in what I called a needless war. And so I looked very carefully into becoming a conscientious objector, and that did not appeal to me. So I did join what we call the Oregon National Guard, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a unit that is called up when necessary, uh, and I felt that I could continue on with my education at that time, and that's quite a few years ago when you stop and think about it. And I thought I, I could uh, continue on with my university education. And then, unbeknownst to me, I had to take a medical. And at, uh, I took this medical, and I promptly was rejected from the Oregon National Guard, who took anybody and everybody. <laughs> and... Uh, and I went down and asked them what the reason was because I felt that uh, this is a way I could fulfill my military duty in, in a, a certain way. And they gave me 18 valid reasons in their book <laughs> as to reasons why I would be rejected from any type of military duty at all after having been checked over carefully. Um, my epilepsy that I suffered from at that time was, uh, was cause number one. Um, I had chronic lung problems with tuberculosis that uh, had uh, restricted my lung problems. And I uh, had big black blotches on my x-rays, you know, from the tuberculosis. And I was born with it. My mother had it. And I was born very, very weak. And everyone was concerned about my mother's tuberculosis, but they didn't know that I was suffering from it also. And so I had every little lung problem that came along from bronchitis to uh, pneumonias to one thing or another and I didn't survive a few times it's just uh, by the skin of my teeth I'm still here I had severe heart problems with a with a very severe heart murmur where I was told I should never participate in any form of athletics I didn't listen to that reasoning and I had a tremendous amount of heart palpitations and it wasn't until about say five years ago my heart rhythm was such that I'd have a beat and I miss a couple of beats and then beat beat and then miss a couple of beats and my heart was just worse than anybody I was working with and so uh, we're working night and day on helping people and at that time my heart rhythm was way way off uh, most of these if people's that I checked over had a heart rhythm as bad as my mine was I would really put them into an intensive type situation of uh, uh, getting cured I tried everything on my heart to get that back to normal, having had a severe heart attack when I was 40, I was told I'd never be able to work again. I had to work at trying to find a way of regenerating the heart. 
Uh, that has since been found. I'm very happy about that. Anyway, there are 18 different reasons. I won't go through all these because most of these, uh, some of you have just as many if not more problems than I had when I was born in, and raised as a small sickly child. I tell people I was at the end of the pecking order in the chicken coop. You know, you ever see the chicken that's at the end of the pecking order? Uh, they're always pecked on, their feathers are gone, you know, and, and they're always, uh, <laughs> they're always scre screaming for survival as the other chickens peck on them. That, that's how I was, the, the original snot-nosed little kid that couldn't, uh, that uh, had a runny nose and sinus problems and congestion and headaches and, and uh, in bed half the time with illnesses being stuffed up with the antibiotics that everyone thought was a miracle cure. Well... <laughs> This is the way it was. And uh, somehow, um, we've overcome nearly everything over the many years. Not seven days. Fair enough? Not seven days, but over many years of learning the procedures necessary, which we call body electronics, to help get the body, this corpus delecti, back to a fully workable situation. Now, there are always a few little problems that arise. I look at them today as challenges, as an educational procedure to find out, now, what do I do with this problem now, and how do I solve it? And these things, I hope that each of you can look at your afflictions as the most wonderful opportunity for an education you could possibly have. And what we'll do is collectively we will help each other out, work together, until a lot of these problems are solved. Uh, some of the problems are relatively simple, and some are highly complex, and uh, it's like a combination lock, and you might have to have 12 tumblers uh, put in line before the combination lock opens. And some of these tumblers are like looking for needles in the haystack, and you have to be patient not only with yourselves, uh, but with people who are holding the points. So it's a, it's a, it's a long, drawn-out situation. Now, for people like myself, um, I've had a tendency to drag my feet. And healing has come slow to me. But yet, from another point of view, it's been a blessing to me because I've had to grind out every single problem that I've had and find how in the world do we correct this. Now, some of these things are on my tapes, and you've probably heard them all. I don't need to go into that twice, but it's uh, um, Anita here. Uh, when I first met her, for example, she was twisted up with rheumatoid arthritis. Her knees were huge. Her feet had about a slab of uh, calcification, and they're about three inches, three inches thick and uh, totally immobilized, really, the ankles, the feet. Her hips were frozen calcifications as large as a golf ball all the way up her spine. She was all curved over like this with all this calcified up in the upper back. Just a slab of calcium across here if I want to call it calcium. It's calcification we'll call it for lack of a better word. Her neck was all calcified and she couldn't turn it. Um, I, I tell people jokingly and I, I hope sh she forgives me sometimes. Uh, sometimes I'm not worthy of forgiveness. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, in, in these matters here, her jawbone was totally frozen here, and she couldn't open her mouth just a little bit to get maybe perhaps a, a fork in through there. That's right. Just totally frozen. And, and now I do, and he wants me to shut up. <laughs> now that the jawbone is totally unfrozen, I can't keep her quiet. <laughs> and frankly, she's such a delightful person, I don't want to. And if I find my buttons being pushed oca occasionally... Um, often, uh, then this is another way of the universe trying to show me where my weaknesses are, where I haven't learned how to be non-reactive to given situations. I'm a tremendous challenge to him. <laughs> a delightful challenge. How's that? Okay. But in, in this situation, all of you have problems. Look at those problems as an educative opportunity. And I, I can't promise you that something is going to heal immediately. I can promise you that when you learn the laws and apply them properly, 
then the healing is going to be forthcoming. And there's been a number of beautiful things that have happened that a number of people here have vis visibly observed uh, in the regeneration of uh, different body parts and whatnot that have been uh, pretty well crippled and so on. All of these things are real that we have dealt with. I think one of the first things we've got to do is make it okay that whatever is wrong with you is wrong with you. And <laughs> and that may be a hard thing just to stop and, you know, we all have things wrong with us and just make it okay that that's wrong with us. And you'll feel this tremendous weight come off of you just by doing that, just saying, it's okay that I have arthritis right now. It's okay that my arm's not working right now. It's okay that uh, maybe you're in a wheelchair back there or you can't get up and walk out of the chair. Make it okay and just feel that weight come off of you just by doing that because that's one of the first steps we have to do, just the acceptance of it. The acceptance just allows you to relax and allows you then to open up so your heart can open up to loving and then that's when the healing starts to happen. Bits and pieces that we have to put together like a big jigsaw puzzle here. Are you ready for the first big piece? Okay, first of all, you have to make it okay that things are not okay. Now, I, I, I'm serious about that because we have, first of all, a problem, a deformity, a sickness, an illness, a suppressed trauma that has affected our entire life. And that is going to be involved with resistance that we talked about on the tapes that I hope all of you have listened to carefully. So basically, we have resistance to a situation, to a trauma, and that resistance is then recorded in the physiology of the body as a definite condition because the body has a certain resonance factor where certain thought patterns, word patterns, and emotional patterns will then have this resonant factor in the human body. Okay, so we have a problem. Now that problems are held in place by our resistance to that problem or what we will call resistance to the resistance. Now this resistance to the resistance oftentimes continues on with all of us because it's not okay that something is not okay and we're not willing just to let go and follow a simple pattern of non-resistance. Now, if we can follow moment by moment in the now, in the ever-present now, 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 now type of thinking, the pathway of non-resistance, then the human creation, if I can call it that, which is the outer manifestation of the suppressed thought, feeling, and spoken word. Okay? The outer manifestation. In the Oriental philosophy, the outer manifestation is the yin. The creative force is the yang. And so if we can look at the outer manifestation as being the yin, so to speak, then the inner creative force of the thought patterns which are the sensory experiences, the word patterns which are the verbal expressions, and the emotions which we call the feelings that we have, those three things and only those three things are, is that creative 
force or power which is behind every single outer creation. There's a young lady here that doesn't want to be made... She just wants to be very quietly in the background. But doggone it, there are some people who have certain knowledge and ability and talents. Heather Rickhill, are you here? Would you mind presenting your body up here before this awesome group of curious people? <laughs> You've heard of Heather Rickhill. Now, I want Heather, if she would be kind enough, to take a few moments and banter back and forth with me, Heather. Fair enough? Uh, this gal is a very respected, very well-known registered nurse, and she's uh, an instructor in body electronics and has helped countless numbers of people with their individual... Oh, thank you very much, Jennifer. There we go. Has helped many people. Is that working? Yeah. Say hello. Well, good morning, everybody. Is that on? No. Good morning, everybody. No. Here we go. Well, good morning, everybody. That's right. Okay. <laughs> That's she's working. <laughs> now. When I think I first met Heather, she was at a um, conference at Jenny Edgeley's up in Narang. And uh, Jenny has a little healing center up there doing a lot of Bernard Jensen's tissue cleansing work, and she's helped a lot of, a lot of people through making that available. Now, while we were there, we were talking about this very principle of thought, feeling, and spoken word. We're talking about non resistance and we're talking about the different laws that govern the human body which we're going to get into in what we call the laws of love light and perfection so we have all of these things that we have to deal with and body electronics isn't worth a darn without the application of these principles so get these in your heart some of you, like myself, are going to have a struggle learning how to use them. Because even though we're given information through our prayers, it may take us many years before we can learn how to apply them because of trying to fit it into our scientific mode of thinking. I was trained a mathematician. I had my training in science and chemistry and mathematics and believed fully that seeing is believing. I'm still trying to shift that thing around because our early education is a scientific approach and the truth of the matter is is believing is seeing switch it around we see things out there according to how we believe and the scientific approach that, that believing is uh, that seeing is believing that's an old outdated moth-eaten approach um, we'll get to you, Heather. You want a chair? There's a chair right over there. Hang on. Anyway, what I want to say here is that the law of love is the law that was taught by Jesus Christ. Now, some of you know nothing about Jesus Christ because you have been trained in other religions. That's fine. The time is now to bring all things together into a oneness of all the teachings of all of the great masters. Jesus was responsible for teaching the law of love, unconditional love. No restrictions, no shoulda, coulda, wouldas, no, well, I'll love them if they are deserving of our love. No, you love unconditionally. And you're going to have to sort that out. I'm still trying to sort it out myself because it's sometimes difficult to love in a situation where somebody's really pressing our buttons very hard. 
I tell people <laughs> this is something I had a hard time with uh, having arthritis because I think most of you know that arthritis has to do with a lot of suppressed anger and um, this is where something a person told me this statement one day and I really started to look at it people are not against you they're for themselves and when you realize that they're just doing things for their own for their own personal gain or for their own um, comforts or wealth or whatever whatever they need at that time so often we feel that someone is doing something against us and it's not that they are doing it against us they're just trying to look out for their own selves their own bodies their own wealth their own family their own ten acres and when these things happen if you just say that to yourself you realize that and if you really look at them objectively you'll see that it's true and um, we also when we say to love someone okay you can't expect someone to be something other than what they are okay <laughs> If you know someone is a thief, okay, now, and you let them into your house, all right, you know that they may steal from you, okay? That is the nature of them, okay? Now, we're not saying get to the point of loving where you're going to expect them not to, not to steal something from your house, okay? But if you could come to a place ex of accepting people for where they are at because we're all at different levels okay some of us are highly spiritual some of us are coming right from the bottom just starting with basics you know changing from uh, bacon and eggs to uh, you know maybe ba uh, eggs without bacon or, so four, <laughs> or four poached eggs every morning <laughs> or four poached without the bacon <laughs> and forget the ham too okay and garlic and onions <laughs> but you can't expect someone to be other than what they are and if if you start to look at people in that light also then it's easier to love them it's it's easier to see what you're dealing with and then love them for the way they are instead of trying to say well they should be like this they should be more like me. They should be, you know, uh, they shouldn't be uh, cutting my trees down across the yard, or, <laughs> or whatever, whatever they're doing. Okay, they are where they're at. Uh, to them, trees may not be important. It may be important that they get enough money, you know, to uh, do blah 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 or whatever. So if we know where they're coming from, then it's a lot easier to say, you know, that's the way he is, and. Um, I'll love him for the way he is, where he's at. This takes out the resistance. Now, the law of love is absolutely imperative that we learn to understand that. And just like Anita has just said, just accept things the way they are. Uh, you can't take the genetics out of a Doberman Pinscher and make him a Fox Terrier. And some of us are fox terriers, and some of us are poodles, and some of us are Doberman pinchers, and some of us are little Shetlands, you know. I mean, we, we have all these little different uh, uh, traits that are uniquely ours. Our mother and our father genetically bred them in us. We come by it rightfully. And also, there's cultural factors which you have to take into consideration also because some of the cultural factors are so ingrained in us they're so ingrained and when I think it's one of the greatest things to travel to other countries to meet different people because all your crystals start crunching 
every single crystal you have within you starts to crunch when you meet people from other other nations, other parts of the world, because they do things differently than you do. And, you know, you thought for uh, 50 or 60 years this was the way to do it. Now, all of a sudden, there, someone else is doing it differently. And for you, that may be the biggest crystal crunching thing you've ever experienced in your whole life. Let's look at something here now. Let's go back to Heather. All of these things are important that are being said. They're pieces of the puzzle that we have to consider. So don't have any expectations as to what we're going to be doing. Don't have any don't don't get hung up on what should be we should should be doing. What we're trying to do is to go with the flow of energy for the highest and best good of everybody here. And as we put up our prayers, which we should every single morning, then everyone is going to be given that which will be for their highest and best good. So just kind of keep your prayers up. This is a very important thing, which I should have mentioned at the very beginning. But this is what I assumed we would certainly be doing as it was. But let's go back to the law of love. When you have the law of love, you understand then the law of unconditional forgiveness where you forgive an individual period no restrictions no conditions that doesn't mean you may not pin them up for a while until they can learn to behave themselves okay but the thing is is we need to realize that we do it out of love not out of hatred because oftentimes we discipline out of hatred and anger and frustration rather than simply restrain an individual out of love so they will cease hurting other people and hurting themselves along with it so there's a thing here of of um, restraint cage them up uh, you know, for a while until a person can learn how to behave themselves but create a situation of love that a person can be rehabilitated while they're caged up. Think about that for a few minutes. But you have to sometimes take an apple, a rotten apple, out of a box or else they contaminate that whole box of apples. That doesn't mean you hate that rotten apple. And in this type of work, hopefully, a person can be rehabilitated. And so rehabilitation is the thing that we're looking at. And frankly, we're all in a cage, whether we like to think of it or not. It's a cage of our own making because our collective resistances hold us in this invisible prison with invisible bars from which we cannot escape. And we keep making the same mistake over and over and over and over again. And we wonder, are we ever going to learn when we stop blaming everybody else out there for how we are, we might start looking, are we ever going to learn our lessons? And that lesson will be around the area of what we call unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness, embracing the law of non-resistance. And I might add to that the pathway of harmlessness. Now, Let's consider carefully something here now. I'm going to go back to Heather again because she was being non-resistant in a certain circumstance that she's going to describe to you in a few minutes. Also, Heather was taught at that time the law of light, which she was applying. The law of light was taught, and this might rattle some of your thinking for a bit, because there's a gentleman by the name of St. Germain. St. Germain lived back, oh, about the early 1800s, the late 1700s, and has been around ever since, to my knowledge. Now, St. Germain understood and taught the law of the violet flame. And let's consider carefully the evolution of man. Now get this into your thinking very carefully.
Back in the 1940s, I read a book called Cosmic Consciousness by a man by the name of Buck. And uh, this Cosmic Consciousness started talking about the art of visualization. And in that book, he said from his findings, about 5% of the general population were capable of visualizing. 5%. That was back in the 40s. I think the book was written in the 30s. And I started checking around, and uh, I said, what do you mean by visualization? And that was seeing things in color, seeing things in form, just where you close your eyes and you see a scene there before your eyes, just like it's happening now, just like you're looking at it with your eyes. I found out I couldn't do that. This book must be full of uh, beans, you know, because it, uh, if I couldn't do it, it must not be so. You know how we are in our youth, we think we, think we have uh, uh, a little bit of knowledge and we scoff at everything that doesn't fit into our own little pattern of acceptance. So I scoffed at all this nonsense. I said, visualization, nobody can do that. Until I met an architect who put himself inside of a house when he was designing a house. He looked at it from every single possible perspective. You can see it with color, with form see the grain of the wood and the whole works that he was uh, visualizing. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe. But I can't do it. It took me about eight years of cons continual concentration before I could see my first visual picture mentally. And then I began to realize that uh, something in me was missing and uh, something I wasn't doing properly or else I could visualize. Fair enough? And that took me a long time before I realized it was me, not something out there that's doing it. And so, for many centuries, sound was used as a means of elevating consciousness. And for many thousands of years the ohm was used because people could not visualize properly but they could use sound and so they used the sound of the ohm in the ancient Hindu teachings and they used this in the Buddhist teachings and they used this in Tibetan teachings and uh, for going back you know two or three thousand of years four thousand perhaps longer perhaps but the ohm was used because everyone could hear. And this would elevate the energies of people. Saint Germain came at a time then, and his job was to teach the law of light, which is the utilization of the color violet. In what was used in the ancient teachings of um, What's the, what's the ancient teachings where they worshipped this violet uh, flame that they used in the, uh, back in Persia? The who? Zoroastrianism, that's correct. Now Zoroaster and his followers did this worshipping of the visible flame of light of the, uh, and used this as a transmuting factor. And many of these people hit high levels of spirituality by using this continual violet flame, but it was used as an external flame. Now when St. Germain came, he started teaching the principles of visualizing the violet flame, which most people at that time couldn't do, but maybe 5% of the population could. And so they were drawn into what they call the I Am movement here uh, across the world, in Europe and the United States, and, and uh, they have IM temples up and down through Australia and New Zealand. Now, uh, yes, sir? I'm explaining it now, sir. I'm explaining it now. <laughs> and uh, St. Germain formed an organization which is called the St. Germain Foundation, out of which different books have been published. Um, 
I have had the privilege of knowing people personally who have been instructed personally by St. Germain. Oh, sorry, dear. Your, this chair is on it. There we go. Okay. Now, St. Germain is an ascended master. If we take white light and move it through a prism, we get the spectrum of light, like a rainbow, the violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. We find using kinesiology that if we use black and red, that these will weaken an individual, except in certain situations where red is a stimulating uh, color for people who are very, very ill. But in the majority of cases, using red or using black will take away strength and energy from a person. We find that using the more pastel colors, especially the violet color, uh, some of you have violet on, uh, these are cons very, very powerful colors. And I'm going to make this statement here. Anita might want to talk to you later on about color. But basically, if you wear black or if you wear red and you have a problem, an illness or a disease, it has been my experience over many, many years that people will, who wear those colors do not get well. I hope you're hearing me. I hope you take me to heart here because a lot of people try to disprove me and they get sicker and sicker and sicker because they have a wardrobe of black and red. It's, it's, a, it's a color which is being used by many, many people today, black and red. But these are, if you test them with kinesiology very carefully, you'll find that black and red will weaken an individual, except in the case where, I, where you have an exception to every rule. And your violet, indigo, blues, and, and these colors on the upper end of the spectrum these will strengthen an individual considerably, as will white. And this goes beyond cultural boundaries, because I know the Chinese um, feel that red is a very good color, but yet in the Townsville seminar, I had muscle tested a Chinese woman, and I had her look at red, and she went weak. And I had her look at violet, and she was extremely strong. And she looked at black, and she went weak. And uh, she had thought uh, that the colors, I think red, um, she said, was for happiness, something. Where is um, Herbert? Mr. Lee, are you here? What is the red color for? Happiness, you think? Yeah, you're supposed to think of happiness. And... Um, but I muscle tested her, and she went weak on the black and red, despite her thoughts that they they represent happiness. So this goes beyond cultural boundaries. Now, if you have a person who's impotent, they muscle test very strong on red because it stimulates the lower chakra. Now, just think about that for a minute. Now... This is something that we have to look at the exceptions to the rule. Okay? For every law, you'll have an exception to that law. And we must realize that. So therefore, St. Germain taught the use of the violet flame. And there are, this is only one thing that he taught. But in the use of the violet flame, this will bring out all cause all effect, all record, and all memory, meaning that the cause and effect are the yin and the yang spoken of in the Oriental literature. Okay? It brings out the, both the cause and the effect and brings it back to full conscious recall. It brings everything out in the way of record and memory. So the person has a chance then to change his thinking if he so chooses. I, I get it. Um, I have a little tongue in cheek here a bit, you know, and so forgive me if I offend anybody. But there are a group of ladies, elderly ladies, riddled up with arthritis using the violet flame. 
and they were complaining bitterly because every time they started using the violet flame their bodies became racked with pain and they, had, they couldn't concentrate because they had so much pain in their body they were so angry and so upset because this was stopping them from focusing on the violet flame and I, I tried to explain to them I said now look you're doing it right because the violet flame is bringing life into the body bringing memory back to the body and is helping you in your arthritic condition to re-experience all of the pain of your life that has been suppressed in the tissues now take that pain and treat that as a friend and just experience the pain lovingly until it is gone in other words non-resistance to the pain and a person says well how do you do that because the pain fixates our attention we're fixated on the pain and it takes our full attention on it here's where we here's where we no longer resist the resistance and we make it okay that it's not okay rather than just eh, sitting there in anger and upset condition because we can't get rid of the pain embrace the pain and encompass the pain by the law of non-resistance and the pain simply disappears and goes into the void because there's no resistance holding it in a continual state of creativity you follow me and the calcifications sometimes disappear instantly the moment that you no longer resist the resistance this is a principle that we must learn so that body electronics then becomes a useful tool okay I have a picture here of the violet flame which I'm going to pass around in a minute so you can see what it looks like but I just have a, a beautiful little story to tell you about this picture of the violet flame uh, we had a man come to our home in Kerry Kerry with a severe problem uh, he came he flew all the way in from Turkey and when he flew in uh, he told me and John and I that he was seeing this the symbols this symbol the symbol looked like a question mark not a question mark he would say it's not a question mark but it looks like a question mark and I see this in my meditations and I see it and it keeps coming to me it looks like a question mark it looks like a question mark so he asked us you know what is it what is it and you know he was there the whole stay I forget I think he stayed three weeks something like that three weeks and we went through all the point holding and everything and uh, finally we were taking the same plane out together we were coming here and he was flying back to Turkey but we had a adjoining plane together so finally we were in the airport the last couple minutes right before we we're gonna leave and he pulled out a picture of Yogananda because he knows that I'm a Yogananda devotee and he handed to me and he said Anita here I want you to have this picture and I said oh god what can I give him you know I was thinking what can I give him I don't have any picture of Sai Baba because I know he's a Sai Baba devotee so I the only thing I had with me was the uh, I am presence so I handed him I figured well that's the only thing I have but I'll give it to him so I gave him the I am presence and he said to me Anita that's the question mark that's the question mark I've been seeing the, the symbol that I've been seeing and I just thought it was just so beautiful he was getting this in his visions and he didn't know what it was and maybe some of you when we pass this around maybe you too have been getting it in some form a lady the other day told me she had it as a keyhole and um, maybe some of you have also seen this and you didn't know what it was so we'll pass this around now and you may connect with it in some way just if you look at the uh, person there they're in the violet flame and on the being on top is the I am presence the, the there's two people there's one on the bottom and then there's one on the top the one on the top is the I am presence and that's you on the bottom in the violet flame 
Yes, sir. I am. What? I am. Oh, you have to forgive my accent, sir. It's totally non-respectable here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I I said I remember I said I am one time and somebody thought there was a new type of sweet potato or something. <laughs> now back to Heather. She was visualizing the violet flame moving up through her body, up through her body, while she was holding her body perfectly still. Zero point holding. I had a couple of young men on each side of her to prop her up if she happened to go through a, a healing crisis and pass out on me. <laughs> In the meantime, I'd like to have Heather tell you a story firsthand so you hear it from her own lips rather than see it on a piece of paper or or get it on a tape. I want you to hear this from Heather Brickhill. She doesn't want to be noticed today, so... Well, I guess first of all I need to say that um, I had come from the, the orthodox uh, traditional nursing medical background and I knew absolutely nothing about alternative medicines or therapies. I'd seen a few people who came in um, from various natura naturopaths and so forth and they seemed to be just about as screwed up as the they do with the, the average doctor. So I thought, well, you know. <laughs> and um, and I... I re and this was the first alternative type, um, shall I say, seminar that I, I had ever been to. I had never heard of um, violet flames, point holding. I had heard of iridology, um, so that I really was a raw beginner. And um, following some point holding, um, John called me up in front of the group like this and I had no idea what was before me. And uh, he took me into a visualization um, session um, where I, to, to have recall memory of my appendix operation, which I'd had as a young girl. And, um, and, and b by visualizing the, the, the violet flame, um, I could feel, well, activity in, in my old um, um, appendix scar area and, um, and then following the, the visualization um, segment, I went down to the back of the room with Anita and uh, another lady and I checked the scar. Now it was, you know, 45 years or so ago under pretty primitive conditions that this operation had been performed in Western Queensland. Um, there was no real hospitals or anything out there then. And um, it, so it was a very wide, a very rough, what we call keloid tissue, not the fine hairline little tiny scars that they have these days. And all of this um, heavy, rough, ropey sort of skin had all just gone and there was just a very fine line left. And um, that's, that's all I have on. Now, before Heather goes back to her seat, I want you to either deny or confirm what I'm going to say here. Thought, feeling, and spoken word are the only three things behind every creative act. If there's resistance involved, then these things become a permanent part of the human body. Okay. Heather went back and recalled the scalpel's knife, the, the, the knife, the scalpel, cutting through the flesh and felt it just like it happened in reality, in the now. Yeah, that's right. It, that's, I, I, could, I was right there and I, I could feel it 
and see it. Right under the shade of the tree with all the flies buzzing around. A pepperina tree. There was no operating theatre. Right. <laughs> That's right. Okay. And so the re-experiencing then of the scalpel. And as that moved across the abdomen, she had what we call the fire of the kundalini, which is spoken of in the ancient Hindu scriptures. This burning, searing pain, which many people have tried to find through their meditative techniques. And this burning, searing pain was so great that she was sitting there sweating, nearly passing out. And what came out of your system there at that time? Do you remem remember that, the way of the anesthetic? Well, there was just this boiling sort of blast of, of hot air. It, it was just absolutely amazing. I, I thought, well, you know, I, I, don't, I can't tell anyone about this because who would believe me? And, and, and so that, um, yeah, I mean, this, this, oh, this was a bit mind-blowing to me at the time. I mean, I've seen plenty now, but at that time, I, this was all very, very new and very, very... I had to sort of dust myself down and shake myself off a bit before I could, you know... Do you remember the ether? Oh, yes, and, and the... You see, it was an old um, ethyl chloride and ether anaesthetics in those days. So you didn't get any needles in the arm. It, uh, they, they whacked a great um, mask over your nose and somebody held you down while they dripped on um, this foul-smelling liquid which you felt you were going to choke and you down jolly near did um, called ether and ethyl chloride. It was the only anaesthetics available at that time. And, and the smell of that comes off the body as it's released um, during point holding. Yeah, and, and um, people could smell it in the room. Do you hear me on that? And so as the person goes back and re-experiences in the ever-present now, that which was suppressed in the ever-present now 40 years ago, or thereabouts, 35, a bit more, bit more. <laughs> and when that happened then the ether that was had been suppressed for all these years in the tissues which from my training in anesthesiology you know you have uh, the body gets rid of the different forms of the gases and kind of a half-life type situation and very quickly this stuff is uh, is metabolized and eliminated in the body but in the re-experience of it on people who have been through operations and the anesthesiologists we have trained they can identify by breathing because they're, they're familiar with the little garlic smell or this smell or that smell they can identify exactly what anesthetic is coming out of the person and so if you have 29 different operations and each time under general anesthetic then each time you have a certain type of thing coming out of the body and it, uh, it's a very exciting situation. Old tonsillectomies, for those of you who are in, in their 60s, remember the old uh, ether that you put you under. And uh, uh, you go through the tonsillectomy, your throat will burn like crazy, and then you have this, this ether coming out of your system. Everyone can, around you can smell it. That usually will happen during point holdings, but sometimes if you're on a heavy nutritional program, and this will happen uh, automatically, and you can't, you can't hold it back. When you're ready to heal, you heal. And uh, you heal on a bus going downtown, and you pass you pass out momentarily and get groggy, and you go back through the sickness in the tummy as you have after recovering from an operation, and there's no way you can stop it. So just don't resist it. Just enjoy. Make sure you have a bucket sometimes on hand. Oh, by the way, um, do we have any buckets available? That's been okay. That's one thing on my list I haven't ha had yet. <laughs> Thank you. Also, uh, one day I was holding John's, uh, under John's little toe he had this callus, and I was holding it for hours uh, one day um, and in the evening. Actually, I went in about till 3 o'clock in the morning holding this point. He, yeah, he, he was unconscious at the time. <laughs> and the next morning we woke up at 6. But you were getting electrical shock. Oh, that's right. 
I was getting extreme electricity. Now, if, if you haven't experienced this, when you do, you'll, you'll think about this situation. How many of you in Holding Points have experienced just getting electrical shock that's run up your arm and you feel, oh, quite a number of you. Been there, done that. Very good. So, um, he w I was getting this extreme electrical shock till 3 o'clock in the morning, and the next morning we had to do a seminar, so we all piled in the car with our um, sponsors, and into the car came this beautiful, beautiful smell of chocolate. <laughs> and then John told me all of a sudden he got this memory of when he used to have chocolate milkshakes after he used to have sports, after playing sports. Yeah, I was the last man on the basketball team, you know, bench warmer, and therefore I had to work doubly hard in order just to stay on the team, and, and after the uh, workout, you know, I'd just be totally exhausted, and just every muscle in my body would be aching, and, and I'd go down here with the other boys, and we'd have a big chocolate milkshake, which seemed to take the pain away. And it did take the pain away. It took all the muscular pain away. And I had a, a beautiful suppressive activity on my body. Nothing else filled the role but chocolate. <laughs> and I ate chocolate whenever I felt this way. And for years, I ate chocolate. None of us in here do that, do we? <laughs> but anyway, the whole car just permeated with the smell of chocolate. And um, three days. for three days. And and he went through this memory. It was nice. <laughs> now, if you've taken perfumes and put that on your body, which are synthetic in nature, and the body would absorb that, and that went into the cells, after point holding, all of a sudden you'll smell these different odors coming out of you, different perfumes, different forms of medicated soaps, uh, different things that um, you didn't know that you ate. Um, um, if, you've, if you're a garlic lover, you might have all this garlic coming out of you for three or four days, and uh, which is a suppressive agent, by the way. It uh, works. It uh, works very good as a, as a medicine. They call it Russian penicillin. But, it, um, but it really, these different things do work quite well. But they are, oftentimes we take things that we have suppressed in our system and as the body cleanses, you have oftentimes the most... F please forgive me for speaking this way, but I'm going to speak very frankly. Some of the times the most putrid, obnoxious odors known to man can come out of the human body from every orifice, including the pores of the skin. And you wonder how in the world you could live with that type of, uh, of, of uh, odors in your system. Better out than in, I'll tell you. But as you're, as you're on the program, you'll find these strange smells, chemical smells that just stench. Um, we had one gal in Indiana, and we're working, we, she had, um, as a young girl, about three years old, she backed into one of these little hot, uh, hot stoves, you know. And as she backed into that, she burnt her back here in the latissimus dorsi area of the, the muscle structure there, and it's third degree burn. And her grandmother, who was caring for her at that time, dumped all this kerosene on her. And this is the, this is what everyone used for any for if you got a scratch, if you got a burn, you, you put kerosene on it. It's a it's an old southern remedy in the states. Everyone used it. It's just a, a snake oil, you know, remedy. Uh, they do it much more, you know, these coal tar derivatives now. They do it much more as uh, as synthetic uh, medications. But uh, um, this little gal had the smell of kerosene going all over the room, and I couldn't figure out where it was coming from, because I figured somebody would light a match, the whole place would explode. And we found out she was going through this burning on her back, and the scar was disappearing there. She had diabetes, very bad. And uh, 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 the diabetes would alternate with extreme hypoglycemia. And when this particular problem was resolved on this back, her hypoglycemia disappeared entirely, her diabetes disappeared entirely, 
and she was back to normal again. What we didn't know and what we learned was that the latissimus dorsi is a muscle structure which is directly related to the pancreas. And so any scars that you have on your body are very real and have an effect on the body. Uh, we have people who have scars from their knee down to their ankle. And in Germany they have found that uh, oftentimes um, these scars will cause lower back pain, for example. And by taking a homeopathic remedy of an anesthetic and injecting it in and around the scar, the scar tissue gradually dissolves away and the lower back pain goes with it. Uh, Dr. Horst Pullman in uh, Adelaide, if you know the gentleman, uh, he uses this technique and he learned that in Germany. He's a medical doctor, uh, naturopath, and uh, he uses this uh, and uh, has helped many, many people with lower back pain. But you find the scars on the knee, fr from the knee to the ankle, and this is why the scars on your body are very, very meaningful. Uh, the injuries to your body are meaningful because they have uh, disastrous side effects on other parts of the body. Now back to Heather. Are you comfortable? Ah, it's a beautiful place up here. Look at all these beautiful people out here, Heather. <laughs> Now, one of the other things that I want to make very clear for s to some of you, because some of you are green as gourds when it comes to body electronics. You're here because a little voice told you to get here. And you don't know, you haven't watched the, pe you haven't even watched the films yet because you hadn't received them at the time you left for the seminar. Fair enough? Okay, you're getting it all in a big package in a big hurry. When the body begins to regenerate, and start moving toward what they call the ascensional process that you'll learn about by studying all of the books in the St. Germain series, okay? The hair will start turning its natural color, returning to its natural color, and the lines in the face and the texture of the skin will return to its natural, uh, its natural beauty gradually. Now, he Heather, would you stand up and just turn around, please? This young lady, if I recall correctly, used to have uh, silvery colored hair. Is that correct? And Heather? Yeah, I was actually fairly, fairly white when I first went to the, the hideaway. And following the, um, the, the segment of the visualization that John took me through, um, as I walked back to my seat, he said, hey there, wait a minute, what color's your hair? And... Um, there was quite a, a very, very dark patch right around the, 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 the top, the, the crown area here. And, um, and, well, I mean, I couldn't see it at the time. But the other interesting thing was that um, my husband was at home. And, you know, he wasn't going to have too much to do with this body electronics business. And uh, when I got home, he actually had a... <laughs> a dark patch around the top of his hair too, but head because he had a very grey beard and a very grey hair, very white hair. Mm. Now scar tissue, where did the keloid tissue go? If there is no resistance holding it in a state of creativity, through the suppressed thought patterns, which are the sensory experiences, the word patterns, which are the verbal experiences, and the feelings that a person has, when those are no longer held in a state of reaction by the suppression, by the, non, by the resistance, and the person just lets go of the resistance, then the human creation, which is the disease symptom, simply disappears and the body returns to its full normal activity. Any questions on that matter? Everything heals when we let go of the resistance which holds that abnormal condition in place. This includes the genetic conditions that we have when we get in touch with the genetic memories that grandmother had, that great-grandfather had and so on and we release those traumas that are embedded in the cellular structure of the body. We release that and we let it go. Are you with me on this? Now, 
How do we do it? By receiving. Which is yin energy. In other words, by not resisting and receiving the experiences of life that are around us. And as we receive those energies, we then make a choice. Now this has to be a choice, and this is the part that we miss in body electronics, because we sit there and have our points held, and we don't know what happens when the calcifications dissolve. Okay, now get this. You make a conscious choice to receive the energies, to receive the memories of the traumas that are going to arise as that computer chip full of stored memory dissolves under the impact of the pressure. You have a crystal in the body, you put pressure on that crystal. The piezoelectric effect in physics is well known. <coughs> you, put <coughs> you put pressure on the crystal and the crystal gives off an energy. I mean, we have that on every gas stove, you know, you press the button, it clicks, the gas goes on, it's ignited by that spark. You with me on this? So you put pressure on the crystal, and then that crystal, as a computer chip full of stored memory, that begins to... that literally begins to um, dissolve. And you might say, well, where does it go? There's a calcification. It's a material, physical thing. Now, what we find in body electronics is that this physical crystallization is simply an outer manifestation of the thought patterns, the word patterns, and the emotional patterns that we have suppressed all these centuries of time. Question. Please come up here. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Since Bring it I up here. Just Since I entered this room here, I'm still shaking and I'm still feeling all my hands and feet and body, the energy flowing through me. I feel like I'm passing out. But as I've done before, this experience which I had, I dissolved my body in particles which I saw it happened and went to different places and those things happened and if I still concentrate I think I will also disappear <laughs> but I'm so every part of me is shaking then I sit here that room is so much of energy or what I don't know what happened <laughs> thank you did you get hot <laughs> like a like your body is hot okay uh, oftentimes there is this heat that f that flows through the body with recognition of correct principles. And just the recognition and the beginning to practice these things, then the body sometimes not only gets hot, but it starts to burn like fire, like red-hot molten lava running down through the body. After that happens, you have what they call the vibration of regeneration where the vibration of regeneration just begins to remold the entire body and this is where you feel this vibration going down clear to the fingertips clear to the toes everywhere to the whole body and suddenly things start happening that we didn't quite expect you apply the law and you're going to get the blessings of the application of law and there's nothing on earth that's going to prevent you from having that it's very important that you also pray and ask. Ask to have these memories brought forth to you. Ask. Ask God. Ask your I Am Presence. Ask the being that you pray to, whoever that person is or being is. Or Ask. Please pray and please ask that these memories be shown to you at this time and when you ask then these things will come to you because if you don't ask you won't receive and that's very important so all of you uh, 
ask to your God, to your I Am Presence, for this healing to happen. I hope you're ready for this. Just open your hearts a little bit, folks. Just open them. That's all I ask. I'm going to talk about Jesus a little bit. All right? Uh, here's this fellow, you know. He's a human being. And he lived a few years ago. But what he did, he said this very simply. He said, All the things that I have done, ye shall do likewise. Yea, even more. That's simple. All these things that I have done, ye shall do likewise, yea, even more. Now his job in that day was to teach the principle of love to the world. He did that. But there is a little thing that a lot of people don't understand that he taught that I want to explain to you, if I may. And you might think, well, how can the world, uh, you know, how can this be so? because the teachings of men are so far away from the teachings of God. I don't want to criticize people because they're doing the best they can, but man is in a darkened state of disarray. You've got about 50,000 different Christian sects out there all giving their own version of Jesus, and they all contradict one another. Now, I went to school originally to become a, a minister, a Presbyterian minister. I was raised a Presbyterian. After one year of being exposed to the contradictions within the Christian community with all these different people that I was listening to carefully and their theories and their thoughts, I rejected the whole lot. Fair enough? Because there wasn't one of them that I could in, conscious, in clear consciousness dedicate my life to teaching that particular doctrine. So I became a mathematician. And you can count on that. <laughs> you know, fair enough. That was something to me that uh, you could count on. Don't, don't run yet. Now, I had the privilege of meeting several different people in my lifetime that were taught by the resurrected Jesus Christ in a personal nature. Jesus is very much alive and well, and he does teach people who are ready to receive him in a very dedicated way. Saint Germain teaches people in the same manner. Fair enough? A lot of people who are into Yogananda, as soon as you, uh, many of you don't accept the, uh, shall we say, the Eastern religions. But you have Babaji, who's been around for over a thousand years, who teaches people. We have met with people who have been taught personally by Babaji in his ashram up in the Himalayas as a resurrected being. One of his students, Lahara Manaseya, has also resurrected and he teaches his people from time to time as a resurrected being. Sri Yukteswar has done also. And then in our time Yogananda has been teaching people as a resurrected being. We have had the pleasure of being taught by a gentleman who has been taught by Yogananda directly in our time. And what has happened here, and I want you all to understand this, is Yogananda came to this one individual and gave him a book. That's in our time, in the 70s. Yogananda died back in the 50s, supposedly. His body was in a state of preservation for months afterwards without any deterioration. But Yogananda came to this one man and gave him a book which this man had made six copies of and gave it to this one friend of ours, one of those six copies. 
And then finally, Yogananda came back to this one teacher and said, I want you to take those books out and burn them if you wish, because the material in there that we have used for centuries is no longer valid. Things have changed so much that these teachings of these different rituals, the different mantras, the different yantras, etc., etc., that have been used for centuries no longer get the same results on people. The herbal remedies no longer get the same results on people. The different formulations that people have used for years no longer get the same results on people. The Ayurvedic medicines no longer get the same results on people because things have changed so rapidly now and the this has happened all in the last five years. Things have happened and changed so rapidly that you don't get consistent results with all of the different balancing techniques that have been used for centuries. And he says, throw them out the window. And this is why many of your healers are frustrated today because what worked 20 years ago doesn't work today. Many of the herbalists are alarmed because the herbs that they used 20 years ago don't work today. Many of the homeopath homeopathic remedies don't work today, and the homeopaths are upset because they can't, they can't seem to get results with people like they could, say, 20 years ago. We're in a new time. And so Yogananda told this gentleman, he says, he says all of these techniques that used to be of value are no longer acceptable because they are not consistent like they were. There has been an energy shift in the consciousness of man that has put us into a new age where now we are dependent upon changing our consciousness or else we succumb to the tremendous influx can I use the word the putrochemical industry? Is that is that valid? Putrochemical industry, uh, where they pollute the cities, they pollute the the, liver, uh, the rivers and the lakes, and this is wherein this is all going to have to change, and it will change as consciousness of man changes. Okay, well, I, I have prayed on this issue when this man reported this to me. And the answer that I got from my prayers is that it is much harder now to follow these practices. But it's not that they are invalid. Okay? It's much harder now. If you're going to follow, for instance, Kriya Yoga, it's much harder to get the results than before, but you can still get the results. Um, many people have made their ascension on doing Kriya Yoga. So um, this is where if you are diligent and you continue on, you will get the results. Now, I was reading from the uh, Unveiled Mysteries this morning, uh, book one. It's on actually page 91, and um, it was saying in there that if people use their God presence in the wrong direction, then the cataclysms of the earth will continue. And this is where you can be doing the right thing for the wrong reason. So this is where when you come from pure of heart, you're with the I Am Presence, with the God Presence, with God, however you want to say it, and you will get the results. Now if you're doing the right thing for the wrong reason, you might want to stop now and think about it. Because this is what is causing all these cataclysms on the earth. and you know, they're multiplying and multiplying. If you look at how many uh, earthquakes and 
cyclones and everything that we've ha been having lately. So this is where we can affect these things. We can, if we are pu pure of heart, we can affect what is happening with the earth. Thank you. Heather, now you've given a lot of thought here to what you want to say. <laughs> Would you like to share anything else on your mind? Did I represent you properly? Did I? Completely? Okay, first of all, she had a keloid scar on her abdomen. And as I understand it, it was quite uh, quite distressful to her and quite painful for many well, years. No, it was quite grotesque, really, and and there were under underlying adhesion. <laughs> the, the year of the bikini hadn't arrived, so don't worry. <laughs> but um, no, it was um, with with um, uh, what's it um, adhesions. Um, yes, it, it becomes painful. And the adhesions. Well, there's um, there's been there's still a lot of activity goes on at point as subsequent or has gone on subsequent point holdings, and um, I think there's a lot of adhesions there, John. A lot to be dealt with yet, but certainly it's a, there's just a very faint line of, of scar there now. Where before? It was very. Um, oh, how long's that? About five inches. Um, and and like the, you could see the old marks where where all the old s um, stitches were, and um, it was very ropey. You know how uh, coir rope? Yeah, well that that's uh, and that's how a lot of these old scars. You would know, yes. A lot of you are too young to know. <laughs> we have now the opportunity for those of you that have some serious problems. Uh, we had one lady up in Kerry Kerry. Uh, her daughter held her points, and uh, of course, this lady didn't quite know what she's getting into. And she had, again, 40 years of keloid tissue. And she burned and burned and burned and burned and burned after 40 years of pain, and her scar tissue and the adhesions, for the most part, all disappeared. All the keloid tissue disappeared. And she's been going through uh, healing crisis after healing crisis in different parts of the body ever since, and still uh, s determined, you know, to make a change in her life, and she's done it. And it's been a wonderful thing to see. But not without paying the price of pain that has been suppressed over many emotional and physical traumas. And these things we have to be willing to go through and encompass as a friend with non-resistance and with no desire to harm anybody but nothing but for, uh, forgive unconditionally all the real and imagined ex things that have happened to us. Fair enough? Okay, Heather, I want to thank you for coming up here and gracing the front of the room. Yes, uh, I have had a long battle myself with fluoride and teaching everyone every day, I think of my life, the harmful effects of fluoride. And I want to thank all the other naturopaths and therapists out there who have joined with me in telling people about fluoride. And step by step, I've taken one person after another and told them about fluoride. And here I read, someone brought this up here, I'm just going to read the first part. Um, on 30th January 1997, the Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Jim Sorley, announced the formation of a committee to decide once and for all if Brisbane would have its water supply fluoridated. On 1st of October, the committee brought down its surprise decision that Brisbane's water supply would not be fluoridated. After studying the facts about fluoride, Mr. Sorley came to the conclusion anyone who has put fluoride into the water could be subject to legal liability in the future. Fluoride is a poison. It kills you if you take too much. No city would get away with introducing fluoride now. 
And it's these things that you keep planning away day by day by day and you person by person. You all see this up here? New Dawn, which date? The latest one? I, I don't see the date on it. Number 45, November, December 97. And it's uh, on page number 6. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, I have do have a few people that I want you to get to know. Uh, Hank, would you stand up, please, and, and come up here for about one minute? Uh, Hank Brower very quietly goes about his work. Uh, he was absolutely instrumental in establishing the Body Electronics Institute of New Zealand which has had a few um, hiccups along the way, but it's now pretty well beginning to get ironed out, hopefully. And uh, Hank has just recently, uh, he has been voted in as the new president of the Australian Association of Body Electronics. And um, so I want you to get to know Hank. Uh, Hank is... Um, is doing the best he knows how with what he has to work with and, and down in Sydney in the fluoridated water area. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, through th the different uh, work that's here, there's about 25 people here from Sydney and the surrounding area. Raise your hands, folks. That's quite, that's quite a big number right there, more than 25. Thank you very much. And Hank, thank you for your continued good work. Now uh, we have uh, Greg. Where are you, sir? Greg, would you stand up, please? This is Greg Barnes, and I believe that he is the man in charge of the secretary of the organization. Is that correct? And last but not least, uh, we have Carol J. Would you stand up, Carol? And uh, Carol is the uh, treasurer, if you want to. Um, and this little gal's been through the mill, and I think that she will be uh, very happy to serve you in that capacity. Okay? And uh, so that's uh, that's been wonderful. So a lot of good moves have been made here recently, and uh, I I want to be great. I want to thank um, Rob Rubin and uh, Sakara Douglas. Is Sakara here? Is Rob here? Um, is Julie Wood here? Is Anna Voss here? Okay. Well, these folks here have. Uh, um, men responsible for helping to spearhead the organization and a vote of thanks should go to them to get this established here in uh, here in Australia so that's uh, they're not here now Hank will be here to help out and to be around to uh, be of service to you uh, during healing crisis and what have you and Hank we're grateful to have you here now who's that big long lanky fellow there <coughs> Kyle, would you stand up, please, and be careful not to bump your head? Uh, <laughs> uh, this is Kyle Grimshaw-Jones. He's a current instructor down here at the Naturopathic College in hydrotherapy. He works up at the um, uh, works up at the Hippocrates Institute as a, as a resident naturopathic physician, and he has done a wonderful amount of work uh, throughout the. Uh, throughout the area on helping people with point holding and their various problems. So Kyle, it's very good to have you here. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he has a vast amount of knowledge here that he will be sharing with you. And uh, Kyle will also be helping to instruct up in uh, northern Queensland at the uh, in March and April of this next year for the instructor seminar for body electronics. So Kyle, good to have you with us, sir. Also, Kyle is involved with the wheatgrass juice. I know a lot of you had questions on that. 
and um, wheat grass juice at the Hippocrates Institute here in Majuriba. So um, he's the man. He knows he knows the scoop on wheatgrass. <laughs> and uh, he's good and green. Right. <laughs> So I know some of you had questions on wheatgrass because it's on one of the major things on the program, wheatgrass juice. So he's the man to ask about these questions. Thank you. Kyle, is there anything you'd like to say about taking a pitcher full of uh, wheatgrass juice all at one time? I wish the guy that, I, that uh, saw that happen wouldn't tell so many people. <laughs> 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 Thank you, sir. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, who uh, Carol will be working with us today and helping out. Now, this little gal here has a vast knowledge of experience behind her and has experienced things which few people on the face of the earth have had the chance to experience. And it... Um, pardon? Like what? like getting into the mental body and understanding how the mental body works. I think Carol can talk to you a bit about that. But uh, we'll let that happen at a later time, Carol. And then, Gloria, would you stand up along with your uh, little fellow there by your side? Uh, <laughs> uh, this is Ian and Gloria Bamberry. And these two have been, uh, they're both Reiki masters, and they have been very instrumental in helping many, many people in the area here with body electronics, and we're grateful for them. Now, who did I miss? Helena, are you here? Where's H Helena? Helena? Are you here? Oh, there oh, she there is. Oh, there you are. I didn't even see you. I here. thought I saw you back there before. Uh, it's uh, very good to have, are you here for the day? Oh, very good. Welcome, welcome. She has a large point, large and growing point-holding group up on the Sunshine Coast and is doing a marvelous job up in that area. So uh, she's teaching five? Thank you. And so she's been doing a lot of teaching, a lot of helping, and uh, people are making good progress up in that area. Where's Jason? Is Jason here? Is Jason? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Who did I miss? Any other uh, uh, please, if, uh, helpers? Please, the people who are helping out here, who did I miss? Did we get them all? Okay, I think we have... Who? Is Leanne here? Where's Leanne? Uh, Leanne, this is a better part of Jason. And, it, uh, <laughs> and uh, Jason and Leanne are kind of a team working in body electronics. And uh, Leanne, good to see you here. Very good. And she'll be helping out also. Been very diligent for point holding in a couple of years. Point holding groups and so on. That's been excellent. Now, yes, sir. Could you please come up and ask the question on the The, mic? the question is, basically, is there anybody here that has a point holding group in the ACT? Not that we know of, but you'll be part of it. It'll be formed here, and uh, how many ACT people are there here? Raise your hands high. You, you got about six people, one over here, and five over on this side. There, there you have it. At Canberra has uh, six people here, so that's uh, we're grateful for that. Okay. Now let's see. I have a whole flock of questions here that I didn't get to yet. Now, a lot of them will be handled tonight at a question and answer period that is scheduled to be after from about 7 till 10. Is that correct? 8.30 till 10 or thereafter. But we'll get a lot of these things done. We're, we want to take your questions. I already have a whole bunch of questions here that have been handed to me. I've, a I've asked for you to write your questions down. A bunch of these will be going to Anita, who will be taking care of a lot of the nutritional factors tomorrow. That's why I'm not uh, answering your questions now. 
and we'll try to get everything as compact and together as we can. So take your questions, write them out in full. You don't have to sign your name to it. Um, I reserve the right not to answer personal questions. Fair enough. But questions pertaining to principles of body electronics is what I'd like you to, uh, to center in on. And questions pr pertaining to specific things that are of concern to you. Now, we'll be, um, are things going to be filmed at all in the other room, Rob? Okay, then I'd like to take about three or four minutes here. Point one. I would like you, when we get into point holding, to have your nails clipped closely so that you don't impale the person that you're working on. That's the first step. Clean your hands. Now, you're going to be working with feet. You're going to be working with uh, different points on the body. And some people have had some pretty marvelous problems. I want you to keep your hands clean and, uh, and, and, and wash them off as uh, frequently as you possibly can so that we're working in a hygiene uh, area. Uh, we don't have to be fanatic about that, but hygiene is a very important aspect here. When we hold a point, this is one of the questions that we have. When we hold a point, you don't jab the individual. You start very carefully with great deal of consideration and gentleness and find out where the painful spot is on the reflex point that we're dealing with. And there are some people who seem to take great pride in seeing how much pain they can inflict initially. If somebody starts pushing too hard on you, you have the, not only the right, but the responsibility to say, back off, you're giving me more pain than I can lovingly and willingly endure. And oftentimes we think that uh, uh, everything is being done right when the pain is so severe and pain is being inflicted and we're not causing the person pain. Remember that. We're creating a safe, gentle, joyful environment where the pain that people have accumulated over the centuries can be released gently. Is, is this clear? And we gradually increase the pain within the level of the person's ability to lovingly and willingly endure. Now granted, there are times that you can touch a person just like this and they feel like they're a skewered shish, shish, shish kebab and they feel that somebody just shoving that old skewer right, in, skewer right into them and they're in tremendous pain and all you're doing is touching them with the tip of your finger. Sometimes when that energy starts flowing and that crystal starts dissolving, your pain coming out of that crystal is amazing when the person is doing nothing more than just touching you. So the best thing to do is start a very trusting, close communication with the point holder and talk back and forth. I don't think a point holding is meant to be like a funeral dirge where you can't laugh, you can't scratch, and you can't burp occasionally. Now, <laughs> now if you burp at the wrong end, that's an occupational hazard. But that happens too. Now, if you have to get up and go to the loo, then you have to go to the loo. The alternative co uh, consequences are, are disastrous sometimes. And please, I don't want any of the men asking me for jars. <laughs> Kyle, you're in charge of jars. <laughs> um, Listen, if you have to relieve yourself, go and relieve yourself and make sure that when you come back to the point holding table that everyone knows where the points are and you just re continue on where it is. Um, that's fair enough. Now, there are some of you who will have pain that will be coming out of your body. Just learn to lovingly and willingly endure the pain. It may take one day, it may take one hour, it may take several days. 
in some isolated cases. But most of the time, the point holding will be completed within an hour and a half to two hours. Now, in the classes that we have in the morning and after lunch, when, uh, when we have a little get-together um, to answer questions and to share experiences that people are having, um, remember this, don't hurry these things. Uh, Sakara has made arrangements, and I'm very grateful for Rob and Sakara for doing everything in their power to get things nice f for us under the circumstances where we have such a large crowd. But if we have 20 people who are going to go past the time where we normally would break, then the food will be made available for the people and will be saved. And we'll take account on that so that uh, things will move smoothly because we have to feed the hypoglycemia. Okay, is that fair enough? We have to feed the animals within us. And uh, uh, this is one thing that we hope to do. We don't miss a meal because you'll need all the energy you can get. Um, any questions so far that I didn't cover briefly? We will be covering the things in the point holding. And uh, uh, we certainly covered a lot of stuff on the Milburn tapes that you've all listened to. And so there might be an odd person or two that has missed some of the information. We'll get that covered. You write down your questions. I want to say one thing. If we have somebody on the table and they have been through a lot of heavy-duty unconsciousness operations and so on, there are the odd situations where we will have the hole in the aura closed up. And there will be ice cold, and the room will be warm in this tropical climate. But sometimes the, the room in, around that area of point holding will become absolutely ice cold. You'll feel it creeping along the floor and crawling up the legs, you know, of everybody. How many have had that experience? Can I see a show of hands? About t ten of you. Okay, here's where we get into a situation that is imperative to understand that oftentimes there may be a hole in the aura closing and oftentimes we may have a very shall I use the word exciting and unexpected entity release now if that does indeed happen you call one of the helpers over here and they will all help you out and getting through that and we'll explain this a little bit later on on questions and answers uh, don't have any expectations Okay, and don't be attached to the outcomes. Just allow things to happen in their natural course of time, and eventually everything will come out all right. It'll be a little scary for some of you uh, who have not been initiated yet to some of the things that you'll see. We have a crowded room. We don't know what's going to happen. We do know things are going to happen, but we don't know what, we don't know how, and we don't know when. But just keep on your toes keep your communication up and the people who will be around working with you will just give you instructions as to what to do. Bottom line, hold the body perfectly still and keep on breathing. Just breathe deep and regular. And if it, you continue breathing well and get the oxygen in the system and hold the body perfectly still, you will then have access to the emotional body and go through the numbness and go up through the different levels that you're all familiar with on the levels of emotionality. That's exceedingly important. Any questions? Okay, uh, I think they're ready for us for a little bit of uh, break time. Sakara, is there any announcement on that as to what to expect? Hello? Yeah, I'll just some um, morning tea served down in the sandbar, which is just downstairs. Um, it just at the bottom of the stairs or one one level on the lift there's fruit fruit juices herb teas and that waiting for you down there and then we meet again in the coral room on the third floor um, at 10:30 for point holding we have about 15 minutes uh, can we have a 15 minute lag here yeah why don't we make it make it back here uh, uh, take a good half hour of break and be back 
at a quarter to 11 in the where? Coral Room. The Coral Room. That's on the third floor. Third floor. Where we met last night. Okay. Third floor Coral Room. Hand me your questions, please, so I have record of those. Now for questions and answers, this is your evening folks, and uh, uh, this is your evening on questions and answers. If you have any questions, let them rip. Now I have a whole bunch of them here that I, if you want me to go through some of these for a while, I'd be happy to. A friend of mine back in Perth had a kundalini burn in her heel and it burned for about three hours and she wanted me to ask you what is the significance of that and um, whether what desirable factors does it have? <laughs> That's like 20, 20 answers for one question. Um, a kundalini burn in the heel, it depends on what part of the heel now you have a very interesting thing here because down in the back of the leg you have the gastrocnemius muscle is tied in to the soleus muscle through what they call the Achilles tendon way down at the bottom of the back of the heel okay and that kind of goes down over the the heel itself and sometimes when you're looking at the heel you're you're not dealing just with one organ or one part of the body. You could be dealing with the entire pelvic area. You could be dealing uh, with the pancreas and the adrenals, which are tied in the gastrocnemius and the uh, uh, pancreas. You could be dealing with the tailbone. You could be dealing with the sacrum and tied in to the uh, to the uh, the entire uh, pelvis and the, frankly there's no one answer for that you'd have to take a look and find out what happened and what part of the body seemed to heal to where it's functioning normally now the iris of the eye may give you an indication if you have a series of pictures of the eyes where you can see okay here's the eye before the the kundalini burn for three hours that's a long time and then here's the picture after the kundalini burn and you can see which uh, parts of the body were affected but usually after a three hour kundalini burn you've got a whole big change in the iris of the eye and it's a whole hologramic effect rather than just one particular organ which has gone through a transformation and I can't answer your question is what I'm trying to say it's just a, it's a confusing answer because it's not just one clear-cut answer uh, which you find in body electronics. There's no clear-cut answers when you're dealing with the kundalini. Uh, you'll find a person will have a kundalini burn and the entire iris will change color like we had tonight uh, or earlier today, last couple of hours. We had some tremendous iris color change and all the person did was burn. But um, a chiropractor friend of mine that we worked with for a year in, in the South Island of New Zealand, uh, he said anything can cause anything. I began thinking about that. Now this is his, uh, his many years of experience and I think there's a lot of truth to that. Anything can cause anything. And uh, uh, the longer I live here, the less sure I am of, uh, of specifics being indicated by a certain pain in a certain part of the body. It's more or less like a hologram and that's how I'd, I'd probably see that. Fair enough? Okay. No clear-cut answer. Mary? When you are a point holder and your fingers go back to normal, do you still stay on until the point holdy is also totally free of sensation or can you leave the point 
at if that a, time. You'll find sometimes you'll turn the person on and they'll have pain shifting and moving and shifting and moving for days after a point holding. And your point holding is completely flat, but they'll have what they call, we, we say with tongue in cheek, we call it sailor's rheumatism, because it's where the pain just simply moves from joint to joint to joint to joint to joint in the body and just keeps on moving and shifting and doesn't stop, you know? And uh, I think sailor's rheumatism has a, has a good name there, if you understand the habits of sailors. Uh, but there you have, there you have it. And this, the sailor's rheumatism, uh, when you turn that thing on, it'll last for days. And the person will have pain in their shoulder, then pain in their back, then pain in their hip, then pain in their little toe, and then they'll, they'll, in their earlobe, all of a sudden that'll burn like crazy for a day or two, and then um, maybe they'll have a pain in their right toe again. Uh, you know, you never know what they're going to get. But the thing is, in answer to your question then, when you're flat, you're flat. And yet a person says, well, I still have a pain in my groin, or I have a pain in my tummy. Uh, you <laughs> it's, uh, that's a continual thing. You can't, uh, uh, you can't just hold a point forever. When your point is flat, it's flat, and that's it. The, the thing to do is to continue to put pressure on that particular point to make sure that the calcification is completely resolved. Fair enough, Mary? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I'll continue on with this one then. It says on page 35 of the Body Electronics Booklet, points on the head are shown for the nose and ear. Could these be used on children with upper respiratory problems? Okay, let's consider this for a moment. Um, is this... Um, I don't know who wrote the question, but if this is the little question, uh, this little tiny booklet that went out uh, that was correlated by Julie Wood, and they have my name plastered on both the front and the back of it, I want you all to know that I did not write that booklet. This information was borrowed from a fellow by the name of Barry Brown, who wrote this booklet without my approval. And uh, his first little booklet was with my approval, but he, then he went and changed and added to and changed and added to until there's stuff in there that isn't quite valid. Now, as far as points on the head are concerned, we have an awful lot of people who have used points on the head for acupressure, where they hold it for maybe seven or eight seconds and they let go as a stimulation of a point and that's fine but when they start trying to hold a point for as long as half an hour or 45 minutes and they get themselves into a pack of trouble whenever they're using cranial points because the points don't stop hurting and they don't stop burning and they just stay there for day after day after day because and I want to get into some specifics by Dr. Sutherland, who is one of the top cranial experts, was one of the top cranial experts in the world. Dr. Sutherland and his work on cranial osteopathy. I have his book at home. I've read it several times. I've tried to utilize everything he said in there, and to me, I can't fault the man. But Dr. Sutherland said that a cranial scoliosis or what I would call an asymmetrical cranial, will accompany and precede a spinal scoliosis. And I found that to be true. And so in dealing then with a cranium, if there's a cranial problem, the cranium doesn't shift and move around properly until after we get all of the spine straightened out and get all the calcifications out of the spine. And then when all the calcifications are out of the spine and the spine is straight and all the injuries are taken care of and everything returns to normal in that spine and the tailbone's all straight, where about 90% of the people have a crooked or bent-in tailbone, okay? Now, that when those are all straight, 
then we can go into different points on the cranium and there's all kinds of points in that little booklet that if a person starts using those points they can get themselves into one pack of trouble and uh, I would frown very heavily on using these points out of sequence now you'll notice on the cranial or on the uh, body electronics flow sheet I have a certain sequence of points that it's taken me about 45 years to get together how do I know because I made too many mistakes I've tried different things and they haven't worked I tried other things and they work consistently and I found that you do the STO point first and get the nerve supply and circulation down through the body as a general qualifier you make sure that the heart's taken care of you make sure that the firing mechanism of the heart's taken care of you make sure that the pancreas is working properly because that's a major factor uh, we haven't talked about the contraindication on the pancreas yet I plan on doing that tomorrow but the thing that we're looking at here is a sequence of point holding now we have a lot of people who use electronic equipment to kind of check out different acupuncture points to determine which points should be used for point holding these acupuncture points what we're dealing with here we're dealing with balancing points if you understand acupuncture acupuncture is taking an excess of energy from one area bringing it bringing it into where there's a deficiency in another area and you're dealing with balancing type techniques now so as far as acupuncture points are concerned and their uh, whether or not they have a certain resistance factor which is determined by electric uh, what they call electro acupuncture you've seen these little machines it's very invalid as far as we are concerned because we're not dealing with balancing techniques we're dealing with regeneration techniques and the whole system is entirely different so when people are using these mechanical devices to try to determine which points do you use next uh, it, do it doesn't work two different systems it's apples and oranges it doesn't work now likewise we're running across an awful lot of people who are trying to use the pendulum to douse which points are going to be correct a bunch of us went down to Mexico to get trained by Dr. Edward Carl, who is the president of the National Health Federation of Mexico. And Dr. Edward Carl had a place down there in uh, Chula Vista, as near Lake, uh, as near Guadalajara, near Lake Chapala in Mexico. If you ever been there, and he had a port of health there, what he called the port of health. And he'd bring people in there and teach them all kinds about hyperbaric chambers, which is oxygen under pressure in these uh, uh, containers, you know, big big cylinders that you sit around in and get overdose on oxygen. Works great. He, we got trained in all kinds of uh, work with uh, how to handle different parasite all parasite problems, and that was wonderful. But one thing he did one day when everyone is taking out their little pendulum and dowsing, which many of you in this room use the pendulum. And I want you to think about what I'm going to tell you very seriously. Dr. Carl talked to two of my friends who were good, what I consider to be good dowsers. At least I thought they were good dowsers. And another person uh, that I didn't know was supposed to be a good dowser and he asked them all if they were willing to subject themselves to a test where they took slices of a banana put it on a plate and four of those twelve slices of banana would be would be laced with deadly cyanide a lethal dosage every one of them said yeah we can do that no problem we can determine which ones have the cyanide in it so the lab assistant of dr. Edward Carl uh, put these little uh, pieces of banana in a certain sequence on this one plate and then everybody had a go at which individually separately as to which of these banana slices was laced with a lethal dose of cyanide guess what happened all three of them were absolutely wrong none of them got any of the uh, bananas that were laced with cyanide 
Are you hearing me? And so in Chicago, we had about 10 dowsers. Everyone was dowsing, and they are all doing their thing. And so the dowsers all got together with several of my patients. And each one of them independently doused what the conditions were wrong with each person and what they should do for that person to help them to heal. And they were just as different as one dog is from another in a, in, in a hybrid uh, pen. Well, fair enough? Now, this is where we had a problem. And I began to start looking at dowsing because I was trying to learn how to douse and it was just inconsistent with me. And then I realized it was inconsistent with everybody. And so as a result of this, I find one person will argue with another person by dowsing as to which point would be the next point to hold. I throw the whole lot out and I discredit the whole lot. Now somebody's going cannot help but have a certain percentage of accuracy. I know one person who's 50% 50 accurate on diagnosing whether a child is going to be male or female. <laughs> now, um, uh, and with this in mind, I throw the whole concept out, and I don't rely upon it. But what I have relied upon was absolute scientific workability, which I'd like to explain to you at this time, and hope to put an end to all this controversy on dowsing and so on that is being used extensively throughout body electronics, which I have to tell you I'm opposed to it. The STO is a general qualifier. You get the heart going, you need to, if the liver's not working, you put that up, up at the top of the list. The pancreas should be for about 95% of the people. That's at the top of the list. And then we start with the pineal gland. And we start with that pineal gland for a purpose, because if that pineal is not secreting the melatonin, which is a very necessary... Um, hello? Uh, if that's not secreting a very necessary um, hormone, then the hypothalamus is a trigger, is the actual target area of the melatonin from the pineal gland, okay? And then the hypothalamus has eight hormone-releasing hormones, each of which has control over the activity of the hormones from the pituitary gland. And then the pituitary gland, for example, has the thyroid-releasing hormone, which controls the activity of the thyroid. And this goes right on down. Now, we find that for biological transmutation to take place in the body, which will explain... Uh, what happens when you have your exothermic and endothermic reactions in the body, where the body gets ice cold, just like a slab of salmon coming out of a freezer, or it gets burning hot with a kundalini fire. These are definite exothermic and endothermic reactions, and you have to have the hormones there coming from the various endocrine glands to act as a catalytic agent to help these, these different endothermic and exothermic reactions to come about. Now, Dr. Louis Curvran, in his book, Biological Transmutations, uh, has been trans his books have all been translated into English, and uh, there, but uh, the French, you know, they, he has many, many books and papers in French. In French, if you speak French, it's to your benefit then to read that material. But um, much of his material has been fully documented over and over again as to how one element can be transmuted into another element under certain bounds and limitations uh, within, you know, within just everyday living. For example, um, the adrenal gland secretes a hormone called aldosterone which acts as a catalytic, catalytic agent to convert sodium in the body to potassium. Now, when you go from a lesser element, like sodium, to a more complex element, like uh, potassium, it takes a great deal of energy uh, to, to bring about that transmutation. 
that energy is absorbed from the body and, and creates a cooling effect on the body. And so this is where the temperature metabolism comes from. And if you're, if you're, if you're, um, if your adrenal gland is not working properly, then you get heat stroke. You can't get the heat down in the body and uh, you can't stand the heat. So as soon as we get the adrenal working properly, then of course the uh, person can stand the extremes of both heat and cold with no problem whatsoever. This is important. So these hormones act definitely as catalytic agents, but they work in sequence down through the, uh, uh, shall we say, down through the sheet we have on, on body electronics. Now when you take that flow sheet of body electronics and you take that sequence of steps down through there, you build a solid foundation every single step of the way. Now after a while you get down to things like the liver and the kidneys and things like this, fair enough. Those have to be supported and worked with to get them going. And a good iridology, sclerology, integrated diagnosis will tell you which particular areas of the body need a little bit of attention. Now, the problem we've got now is we go to the spine. But if the hormones are not working properly, you can work all day on a big calcification in the spine and the calcification will stay right there. I used to wonder at this about 40 years ago, wondering what in the world's wrong here? How come this calcification doesn't dissolve properly under regular pressure from, from uh, point holding? This bothered me greatly. I didn't understand what to do about it until finally we unraveled the work of Dr. Louis Kervran and the effect that the hormones have on the biological transmutation in the body and now we understand how important the hormones are. And this is why we have a sequence of steps without missing one of those steps on the body electronics flow sheet. And so when I have these people all over America all over India, Asia, using the little pendulums to douse out which point to hold, all I can do is feel sorry for their stupidity because they miss the whole boat and then body electronics for them does not work properly because they're jumping the gun. The only thing that uh, might save their bacon sometimes is that they'll be using, uh, they'll be using a, uh, the dowsing thing and might come up with something which may work for a person. Now, there are times that you have to shotgun, if I can use that expression, a certain organ to help it to function. You have to put your full attention on that and get that going because there's a death pending factor if you don't. And so you have to use something uh, way down the list sometimes and get that squared away so the person can survive. If a person is bloating up with water and the kidneys are not functioning, you better start working on the kidneys and get all that electricity and pain out of the kidney point and let the person start being able to get rid of the water in their system. Fair enough? Sometimes you go down to the ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th thoracic vertebrae and dissolve the calcifications there to get the nerve supply to the adrenals and kidneys so the kidneys work. Now sometimes you have to do that because you've got a serious thing in your hands. But bottom line here, get that spine straight, etc. after you get all the hormones working. And then after that spine is straight, then when you do any type of cranial work, it's going to do quite well because otherwise if you do anything prematurely you'll leave a person right in the middle of a healing crisis and you won't be able to get them out of it sometimes for weeks. How do I know this? Yours truly has done all these things and I've made lots of good boo-boos and it's taken quite a while to get a person out of a mess because I did things prematurely and therefore I don't recommend that. I'd recommend just staying on safe ground unless, unless, unless there's an exception to that. And there's always an exception to every rule. And so leave yourself open intuitively to an exception 
If you make a mistake, then you'll have mud on your face, egg on your face, whatever you like, and you're going to have to go back to basics again and start down with the sequence of steps on the body electronics flow sheet. I think I've answered about 10 questions there on that one last statement here that we just dealt with. Any questions on what I have stated up till now? Okay. It says here there's also a point shown on the back of the head for ability to concentrate. Could I use this on an elderly relative with Alzheimer's disease? What's the answer? You gotta lay the proper groundwork for these points on, this, on the cranium to work. And so you come back to the STO point, you come back to a good nutritional program. A lot of people are trying to do a lot of point holding without any nutritional preparation and nothing happens. And therefore body electronics doesn't work and they make it loud and clear it doesn't work and all I can say to them is you're not working because you haven't followed the rules. You haven't prepared yourself nutritionally so that body electronics can work in sequence. But everyone wants the short, fast silver bullet. And frankly in body electronics there's no s short, fast silver bullet. I, Am I sounding a little bit hard? Well, I am. I, I'm, I found that if you don't follow the rules, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And this is something we really don't need to do because people's lives are very, very precious. And in this day and age, there's such an, uh, very r rapid changes in people's lives. Uh, one day they're here, and the next day they're gone. And you can't delay working with people when they have serious illnesses that uh, uh, that can consume them overnight, and it um, it's a it's a real problem. Any questions, please? Any questions? <laughs> okay. Goodness gracious, Anna. Um, let me digest this. Look at hey, I don't think I'm the best. There's a question on the body electronics booklet on inf on information informative guide. How are harmonic products used with body electronics? Now I just say something very simply. Body Electronics does not endorse harmonic products or any other situation there uh, which has to do with principles that we cannot scientifically prove, I mean scientifically prove and explain how things work. Is that clear? Now I don't want to offend anybody, but a lot of people are quite gullible these days, especially in Australia bless your hearts and you've got people put out gimmicks and things in the newspapers and in the magazines that are absolutely fraudulent and they, they go, goes on and on month after month after month and nobody stops them nobody challenges them but the thing is a lot of things cannot be explained scientifically they cannot be explained even logically and the people who put them out oftentimes cannot even explain how they work or the principles behind them uh, in, a, in a scientific manner. Most people are highly intelligent and they want answers. And when you can't get answers, how can you endorse a product? Is that fair enough? Okay. Now what are the correct procedures for using the point for stuttering? Uh, stuttering is a situation where there's really not a point for stuttering. Now if this turned up in that little handbook, I didn't put it there. This is a disclaimer, fair enough? I didn't write the book, I didn't endorse the book. A lot of that stuff in there is, is really in error and frankly irresponsible to put out in the manner in which it is because it doesn't go into any contraindications, it doesn't go into sequence of application, 
And uh, a lot of people can get into a lot of trouble by having a little bit of knowledge because a little bit of knowledge is a very dangerous thing. Fair enough? Therefore, the more knowledge you have, the more power you have. Now this is a hard thing for a lot of people to swallow because they want the very shortcut, real quick fix silver bullet. And so consequently, uh, the stuttering situation is a very complex thing and it's just not a point on the head. Fair enough? Okay, question. It's a fair question here. How long before we can expect results with body electronics? Kyle, would you answer that please? The question is here, how long before we can expect results with body electronics? <coughs> well, it's a, it's a simple answer to that and a more longer term answer to that. <laughs> uh, you know, some people, they, they work, you know, and they start to get some burning in their body <coughs> and they're not uh, yet ready for that, or they decide they're not ready for that, and then uh, they wish it would go away, and it goes away, and then they have to spend four more years trying to get it to come back. <laughs> you know, so be grateful when you get some burning in your body. But you need to be physically prepared and psychologically prepared to go through the traumas. If you're not willing to, then it's you that isn't working. It's you that isn't getting results. Body electronics is a set of disciplines and principles to apply systematically and appropriately step by step and you work through it and gradually the results come when you no longer have resistance to not having any results <laughs> so when you don't have resistance to having no results then you'll be able to get some results whenever that is thank you and that's the way it is. I hope I've answered that question <laughs> via Kyle, but that's the way it is. And it's a, it's a good question because it depends entirely upon the individual and their willingness to receive, their willingness to apply the laws and transmute and to uh, literally uh, follow the procedures. We have so many people, bless their hearts, they want to get well, but they don't want to study. Uh, they want a quick little magazine that they can read and uh, and uh, transmute their lives and ascend, you know, without having to put forth any effort whatsoever because they want somebody to do it to them or for them. They want a little gadget they can hang around their neck that's going to make them all balanced up and, and uh, keep that balance there. Now, uh, it isn't that easy, folks. It isn't that easy. Here's a one that will help you. Can points be held on people who have had spinal surgery? And if so, how soon after spinal surgery? We have dealt with a lot of people who have had fusion of the vertebrae in the spine, everywhere from the neck to the lumbar area. And it's it's been a, a very interesting thing because for example uh, the wife of a president of one of the large insurance companies in the United States was brought to me back in Columbia Maryland and uh, she had a TENS unit packed on her back to take away the pain uh, she had two fusions from a whiplash in her neck and for th and uh, the doctors had uh, considered that within a year or two she'd be totally uh, uh, incapacitated in a wheelchair. That was about 18 years ago. Now after working on her for two hours we dissolved the spinal fusions, the cervical fusions in her neck, do you hear me? Dissolved it so she had complete extension and flexion of the vertebrae. The chiropractor here will understand that and everything was absolutely wonderful there for her about two hours of working on it all we did was put a thumb on the calcifications and she had been 
she's ready. And she was able to get the burning, searing pain in the neck area, and the neck completely, completely restructured itself to where uh, one of the chiropractors that was there testing the people after doing this uh, work uh, uh, said everything is back to normal. Well, she is back water skiing again. Everything was fine. She no longer had any pain in her neck and no longer any pain in her back that originated from the neck. Um, now, this lady is still, I uh, just talked to her, her and her husband on the phone the other day. Uh, some of you are, might be young enough or old enough, shall we say, uh, to remember a fellow that used to pitch for the New York Yankees. If you Maybe you don't follow baseball. Anybody here follow baseball? Forget it. Okay, but um, but uh, he's he's now uh, one of the top presidents of the one of the presidents of this one large insurance company, and sh now they're doing a wonderful job of being of service to other people in many different respects. Anyway, regarding the spinal surgery, after you have gone through the sequence of steps on the body electronics flow sheet, then you come down to the spine on let's say lumbar fusions. Now we've dealt with a tremendous number of lumbar fusions and by holding the ischial tuberosity which is the sit-down bone shall we say on, on the very back of the pelvis you take the gluteal fold and you push in there and you find that little bit of bone that comes way down and by pushing on the bottom of that right directly up toward the head after a person's ready for it they can get wonderful results by correcting all kinds of conditions in the lower back we've had a number of people who have had corrections and the dissolution of spinal fusions in the lumbar area uh, I could go into several statements on that, but that's basically it. What's this here? This one just came in? You just put that there? Yeah. Question I heard on one of the videos that we all have cancerous tissue. Can I use the word trophoblastic tissue? I think that'd be more appropriate. And, uh, but we all have this cancerous tissue. Uh, the technical word for that would be trophoblastic tissue, which is a, if allowed to continue to grow without being corrected within the body, it will turn into cancer. Now, and if we begin this work, we must continue on because the cancerous tissue can grow and we can become worse. Okay, that's partially incorrect and it's uh, only uh, 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 basically incorrect in every aspect. Let me go into it for you. <laughs> Let's talk about the um, um, Let's talk about the scale of emotions. Now you all have this in your sheet. The very first thing that happens when you're on the table, you go through a lot of numbness. I think a lot of you today went through a lot of numbness for a period of time, whether you're a point holder or a point holdee. Now what happens when you come up through unconsciousness? There are actually seven levels within seven levels within seven levels on the emotional scale, which is consistent basically of seven areas. But bottom line, when you're coming up through unconsciousness, what you do is you come up to a point where there's a hyperactivity going on <coughs> at the unconscious level. And when you hit that hyperactivity of unconsciousness, this is where the gonads begin to function at a very hyperactive level because unconsciousness will be tied in directly to gonadal function. I'm talking about the testicles, I'm talking about the ovaries. Many of you know of many people who have gone and had operations and they have had anesthetic and from that time on nothing, nothing works right for them. And the thing is, is that unconsciousness when that is removed with body electronics 
there is a short period of time when the gonads, shall we say, the ovaries, for example, will secrete a high amount of estrogens in this p short period of hyperactivity. Now when those estrogens are secreted throughout the body in a high level, it'll cause a very rapid growth of any tissue in the body which may have cancerous leanings. Now when that happens, there is no check and balance for most people because Un, because the pancreas has not yet been functioning properly and therefore the pancreas is not secreting the proteolytic enzymes such as your chymotrypsin which breaks down the abnormal tissue, the trophoblastic tissue in the body so it cannot grow and become cancerous and so the body has a natural check and balance anybody who has cancer in the body will have a defective function of the pancreas the digestion will not be good and the pancreas is not secreting enough of your enzymes in particular specifically proteolytic enzymes to keep any of your trophoblastic tissue under control now this is wherein sometimes a person will have an injury to their body and within a very short time they'll have cancer spread throughout their whole body and then medical doctors will be sued because the person came in for a checkup a couple of months before and there was no cancer in the body. But a problem can occur wherein with one week's time you can have a very definite cancerous growth, uh, either due to some sort of a precipitating factor which the person may be exposed to, which can cause this to happen. And so consequently, there's a lot of stuff going on which is absolutely stupid on the part of your insurance people where they're trying to sue doctors because they make an incorrect, uh, probably a very correct um, analysis of the condition of the person. And then a week or two later, conditions change within the body and you have very active cancer growth. How many of you are aware that the Australian... Uh, medical Association now really comes out and has stated that two out of three people in Australia uh, have different aspects of cancer in their body. Are you aware of this? The same thing is true in New Zealand. It's been on the news, it's been in the papers, it's been on TV, and I think we should all be aware of that. And so cancer is a situation here uh, which we're all subject to at this point of time because we're living in a highly polluted and a dangerous environment. Now, it says here, we must continue on because the cancerous tissue can grow. We can become worse. Okay, let's hang on for a minute. After you've gone through the unconsciousness and you no longer have a hyperactivity of the gonads, then you're not going to have this tremendous amount of secretion of these... Uh, um, shall we say estrogens to the body which bring about very rapid tissue growth of this cancerous possibility. Now um, I hope that's clear. Now another thing is if you continue on with that and you come up scale which you will determine from the positioning of the fiber structures in the iris of the eye then what will happen here is when you come up to the pancreas level, the pancreas begins to secrete its definite uh, uh, proper amount of your digestive enzymes, including your chymotrypsin and so on, then you don't have nothing to worry about. But it's, it's continual working with that until we can get through the level of the pancreas level, which will be the level where all the grief that's trapped in the body is released through the point holding and the gradual unraveling of the emotional positionings that people have from unconsciousness up through apathy, up through grief, up through fear, and so on. Anita. This is where on the uh, on the point holding sheet you have their STO and then you have plus pancreas because if you have a person that is um, 
suspect of cancer or you know they have cancer, then you want to get that pancreas working as soon as possible. Because see, the pancreas secretes the proteolytic enzymes to eat up the cancer. But most people, from eating so many cooked foods uh, through the years, uh, the pancreas is too weak to do this. So this is where we have that on the top of the sheet, if you notice, it's STO plus pancreas. Um, this is where you would want to get that pancreas working as soon as possible. Now we recommend that people take kiwi fruit, for example. All of the research that has been done in China, and I can't pronounce the university in this, it starts with a G, just outside of Kowloon, just outside of Hong Kong in China, uh, Guangzhou or something like that. What's, what's that? Guangzhou? Okay, I, I fail. Guang? Okay, thank you. <laughs> anyway, they have done extensive research on the kiwi fruit there. They call it the uh, these little tiny uh, things that from which the kiwi fruit have been derived. And they find that the kiwi fruit is full of actinidin, which is a proteolytic enzyme. And they have found that this stuff is very, very good in resolving cancerous conditions in the body. And so we have a number of people who take about 8 to 10 kiwi fruit a day, and we find that the cancerous conditions in their body are pretty well handled because of the high amount of the proteolytic enzymes. But the kiwi fruit have to be ripe. And the riper the kiwi fruit, the higher the amount of the actinidin as a proteolytic enzyme. Now, when we were in the Cook Islands, we worked, uh, Nita and I, we worked with the, with the proteolytic enzymes coming from papain in the gr mature green papaya. And um, this goes clear back into Hawaii when we started working with this. And the, this papain in the mature green papaya, provided it hasn't been destroyed by a high heat process, then that also will have an effect upon the body to give the necessary proteolytic enzymes in our bodies so that let me ask a question here and just see how many of you are up, are up to date on on what's going on you have first of all the carcinoid tumors in the ins, in the colon for example even though you can, it can be anywhere throughout the entire body any good book on anatomy will find carcinoid tumors throughout every single muscle structure throughout the whole body but in our work, it's very noticeable when the body heals from the inside out that the so-called carcinoid tumors that look like little yellow corn that hang on the inside of the colon wall, when the body starts to heal, this is the first thing that comes out if they are there. And then after that comes out, then you have these little things that look like uh, hominy, uh, swollen uh, corn kernels, so they're kind of white and, and fluffy, like uh, not like a popcorn, but uh, it gets into that range, and then that very quickly degenerates into a little pussy willow-like thing with little back feelers on it, which every good surgeon will tell you that they cut that out of people every single day. That's cancer. And then you go ahead, and those things start growing, and you have everything that looks like from turnips to slugs that come out of there. And uh, and these are the, the kind of like a uh, uh, like a gray liver-like material that as these cancers die in the colon and small intestine area, they come, they come out sometimes by the bushel. Now, the thing that will help this will be a high degree of your proteolytic enzymes. And so we recommend that people take a little extra protease as a precautionary measure when they first start out on the program. We recommend that they take perhaps the the uh, papaya uh, drink, which Anita will be talking about to some degree tomorrow. We have some handouts that uh, uh, Sakara has organized for you, I think. Have you got those yet? A whole packet of information of duplicated material? Okay, you haven't got that yet. You will have it. But Sakara will have that for you. Sakara, when, when, what's the date on that stuff coming? You just have to sort it out, okay. They got the basic stuff, but the other stuff will be uh, add-ons that I want you to have so that you can have a real uh, good background of material that you'll need to have knowledge-wise, okay? 
But this business here, as a precautionary measure, we do recommend that everyone take a lot of proteolytic enzymes. Now in the, I know over in Perth, Western Australia, they use a lot of your, um, they, from Enzymes International, the lymphatic enzymes, and that is fair enough because it's very heavy in your proteolytic enzymes, highly concentrated, and also your lymphatic enzymes, uh, your um, um, amylase enzymes, uh, which helps to digest the mucoprotein out in the interstitial spaces that you got that on the tapes. But it's still a heavy proteolytic enzyme source. And so between the kiwi fruit and the lymphatic enzymes and the protease, the food enzymes are primarily for digestion. But the doctor, Dr. Leighton King from Maui, Hawaii, was a top researcher on cancer and, and shark, uh, uh, shark tissue and this sort of a thing, and uh, coral in uh, his research. But he made a statement in his research that taking proteolytic enzymes into the body will increase the immune system up to as high as 2,000%. That got my attention. Now, this got my attention big time because why would the proteolytic enzymes increase the immune system in the body? Well, we find out that it helps to solve problems by eating up and consuming cancer. What does the immune system do? It eats up and consumes cancer when the immune system is acting properly. And we need to have that immune system acting properly. I, I think that'll help you. Now, the Schweitzer and these other things will also help the immune system tremendously. Yes, sir? Some of the words that you say, I'm trying to listen intently, but I get lost with the scientific words and all that. Okay. But what I'm trying to say is, you know, these prolific ones, you say that 2,000 times is better. And in our lymphatic and our pro, pro ones and our ammo ones, there's still the right stuff in them. Now, could I ask, by showing my ignorance, if we all took that prolific stuff, which would be fantastic, would we have to take the lymphatic and the proxies and the amule? I have worked diligently for many years, and I have not found the, pro the uh, lymphatic, shall we say, the mucoprotein, which causes your lymphatic congestion in the body. I have not found that to be removable by any other source but by the lymphatic enzymes which have been designed by Dr. Edward Howell. Yes. Okay, so now that, that will answer that part of the question. Yeah, so there's not just at the end of there I caught something. When your immune system is right, it's like the shark eats the shark because the immune system kills the shark that's killing you, it eats up the cancer. That's correct, provided the communication factors in the body are established. That's why point holding works, to get the nerve supply back to the body so there's adequate communication between the cells and the brain so that the brain knows that there's problems out there. And then when the, the, the brain knows there's problems out there, then seek and destroy and therefore the immune system does its job. But if there's no nerve supply in a given area, then there's no proper signals to trigger the immune response to go in there and destroy something that doesn't belong in the body. So when you get the communication system going, if you get the post office right, the letters will come through and tell people what to do inside of you. You with me? Uh, yes, in part. That's what I mean, yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, I've got my question answered. I went a funny way, but... I don't understand everything, but I've asked. You have to study the tapes, and the, there's material on the tapes, and there's more material on tapes, and there's more material, and there's no end to learning. Thank you, you said. Yes, just a minute. Lita. I'll go through all of the enzymes tomorrow slowly, so you can get all this down if you want. And tomorrow uh, night. Tomorrow night, I mean. Tomorrow night. 
I'll go through slowly the diet and the supplements again. So uh, in case anybody out there has still not gotten it, we'll, we'll go through it at a slower pace. Okay. Uh, Mary, could you hang on to your question for just a moment, please? Now, um, now Sister, could you offer me some reassurance on this and some practical ways to go through my fear? The more knowledge you have, the less fear you have. Fair enough? The more knowledge you have, the less fear you have. Now, one of the problems that we will have is our emotions, which are out of control. No matter how good your nutritional program will be, if you have a lot of suppressed emotionality that hasn't been dealt with and, and where we take the responsibility for transmuting it, that will cause more problems and no matter how good your nutritional program is, is you're still going to have certain sicknesses which can eventually result in terminal illness. And so the thing is, is here's where the point holding comes in, but we still have to be individually responsible for releasing the suppressed traumas that we've gone through that they no longer take their, uh, have their effect upon the body. Now, I, I hope I've clarified this somewhat, but this whole area, we can talk on it for hours on the effect of proteolytic enzymes on the body. A lot of that is in the blue book, the Body Electronics um, um, uh, Handbook. Any questions here? Kyle, yes, sir. You have something you'd like to say? Say that again. Uh, should we talk about pregnancy tonight or tomorrow? Pregnancy. Uh, with regards to proteolytic enzymes. Ah, uh, yes. We'll talk about them now. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Um, now, first of all, the, the papaya. Now, we always recommend that people put the seeds of the pawpaw or the papaya into the blended drink. These seeds are a natural abortive, okay? And in the islands, a lot of people use them that way. They just eat the seeds and they uh, can abort the child, abort the fetus. So uh, this is where if the woman is pregnant, tell her to stay off of the green papaya smoothie. She should not have the green papaya smoothie because there is also a proteolytic enzyme in there which can, um, which eats up abnormal tissue and it may take the uh, developing fetus as also an abnormal tissue and cause it to abort. I trust you're all aware that the placenta tissue can also act in the body much like your trophoblastic tissue, much like your uh, endometriosis, which is misplaced placenta tissue. And all these things here that we're dealing with here, when the proteolytic enzymes will actually eat that up, it'll actually eat up the placenta and cause a spontaneous abortion. But this will be after pregnancy has begun in the early stages. In or Sri Lanka, as they call it now, and India, this is a common uh, use of papaya is used commonly as an abortive because it will destroy the placenta after conception has taken place and it actually eats up the placenta so that there is an abortion and uh, uh, spontaneous abortion and that's it. Now, I'm not going to, to talk now about the the ethical aspects of the unborn child that has claimed that ch that has claimed that fetus already because you have a lot of people who don't believe that there's life in that unborn child but yet that's the moment of conception with many of our people in body electronics they have complete memory of life that took place before conception and, and at the time of conception and in the development of the fetus in the womb with full perception, full knowledge, where they can experience pain and, pain and pleasure 
uh, in every single aspect. So I just want you to consider this. But if you're pregnant and you want to keep the child, stay away from anything having to do with your papaya. Fair enough? Um, I should said mature green papaya, which is full of papain. The ripe papaya has very little papain because the papain has been converted into a sugar by that time. And it's very sweet, wonderful, but don't eat the seeds. Yes, the seeds will still act in the same way whether it's ripe or whether it's green. Yes. Any questions on this? seems to be a confusion in Australia about popo and papaya. They think they're two different fruits, which isn't true. It's papaya, it's papaya. But there's red papaya and there's yellow papaya. Right. Uh, we call, there's a strawberry papaya, which we get in Maui, which looks pink inside. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, yes. Yes, papaya. that's still papaya. It's, it's all papaya. Yeah, yeah, it's all papaya. Papaya is just the Eastern yes. name. Yeah. 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 But there are different species of papaya, and some are still mature green when they're yellow, and some are totally ripe when they're green. And you have to know which species that you're dealing with, because what we want to do is to get what we call the mature green. The mature green is just before it gets ripe, but you have to know what species you're dealing with. Yes, sir? Just a moment, I'll pass it Kanan, thank you for your attentiveness here. Can you use the ripe seed as, as an enzyme? There's a digestive enzyme, the ripe seed, for, seed from the ripe purple. As an enzyme source? Yeah. Yes, sir. Excellent source. Thank you. You'll find there's more vitamin C in the papaya than there is in oranges. You'll find that the seeds are very high in vitamin E. You'll find there's more vitamin A than you have in carrots. And uh, the papaya is one of the most perfect foods that you can take for mankind. And yet in the Polynesian culture, the Polynesians won't eat it because it's pig food. The, <laughs> the seeds are also very good for worms and parasites. And uh, the Polynesian mothers try to, try to have the kids eat it reluctantly. But uh, they get used to having a couple spoonsful every morning to deworm them. Hey, this is for tomorrow night. Can I ask, um, is it necessary to um, crush the seeds, or can you just eat them whole for, for either of those purposes? In the Amazon Valley, the, uh, the people uh, who live there take a pack of the papaya seeds with them wherever they go and use it as a vermifuge. But they don't squash it, they swallow them whole. And that in itself acts as a very good vermifuge. But you have highly curative agents, shall we say, in the papaya seed. And when you crush those and release them, it's excellent for clear curing ulcers and all kinds of problems in the intestinal tract. It's a wonderful, wonderful herb. Okay. Um. With the kiwi fruit, do you peel it? It's uh, it's very appealing. Um, uh, now you can eat it whole if you want to, but uh, the fuzziness there is not the best. But what you do, just take the spoon and just scrape it out on the inside of it, and it's just perfect. I don't think there's much nutritional value in the fuzz on the on the outside. But you can very carefully take everything in there, high in vitamin C, high in chlorophyll. Uh, there's more fatty acids in, uh, in the seeds itself, uh, just like in flax oil. In fact, it's a very good source of your omega-3 uh, and omega-6 in the seed of the kiwi fruit. Okay, also for women that are pregnant, we just keep the, the person on a, a very limited program while they're going through the pregnancy. And none of the points on the ovaries um, are done. 
uh, just the maybe the STO, uh, maybe some of the first basic points, pineal pituitary hypothalamus, but we don't go into the um, other heavier points or the points on the spine during the pregnancy. We keep it to a minimum because we feel that the woman should be spending time with having that child at that time, uh, not healing her own body.